dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Today, in our presentation, let us discuss a very important and often misunderstood teaching of Jesus Christ. It is part of the Beatitudes, actually, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 5, verse 3. It goes like this in English. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What did really Jesus mean by this? How are we going to understand it properly and adequately? It will be very important for us to understand its original formulation, especially in his mother tongue, which was Galilean Aramaic. How would it go in Aramaic language? I will read it in Aramaic. Tu behon mishkenaya berucha dedi lehon malkuta dishmaya. Once again, tu behon mishkenaya berucha dedi lehon malkuta dishmaya. Now, in this teaching, the word is very important, this Aramaic word, berucha, in spirit, which means in essence, in interiorly, deep down, one has to be poor. That means in one's essence, in one's substance, in one's depth, or in one's soul, interiority it meant. Because that's very important. Your inner disposition, you are, your interior disposition must be one of poverty, one of simplicity, one of humility. Now, that simplicity is not something that will be superimposed on you or that would be imposed on you, or forced upon you, you need to choose it voluntarily. You need to embrace it as a result of a choice, or as a result of your, your interior freedom. God is not going to force it, it upon us. When we choose such an interior disposition, our lives will be will be very different. By the way, even a, let's say, a super rich person, if not the, the richest man in the world, could also live a life of poverty in the spirit or the in interior poverty. This does not necessarily mean, you know, you have to be a very poor person to live this life. No. Even a rich person live a life of humility and simplicity. In fact, more than anyone else, they should give that uh, example and that uh, role model unto other people. Because when we live a life of interior simplicity, exteriorly also our life becomes uh, easier. And also exteriorly also we could practice voluntary poverty or voluntary simplicity because your disposition is one of really humility. So what is deeply true inside me is also true outside of me. Actually, there is no such thing as what is personal and what is social uh, in Christian message. They are same. Ultimately, they become like the two sides of the same coin. What I am, who I am interiorly, inside me or in my spirit, is, also, is reflected 
outside of my, uh, outside of my, uh, outside my uh, behavioral pattern. So what is truly true deep within me is also true outside of me. So then I have only one life. I have only one integrity. What is true of me inside will also become true of me outside. So I don't need to put up with a face then. I don't need to act. I don't need to come up with a, uh, a nice social image. I don't need to pretend things because my true real nature comes out. It, ra it begins to radiate actually. So that is why interior disposition is very crucial, crucial and very decisive. Being poor in spirit. Being poor and simple and humble in, inside of me. Then also, it becomes very easy for me to help other poor people also, actually. Because then I am in solidarity with them. By my lifestyle, by my interior disposition, and by my authenticity, I am in solidarity with them. I become a blessing unto them. I will never become a burden unto them because one is living in poverty, in spirit. So for the modern world, this is very crucial. Part of the Christian solution, because as we know actually, in the world, majority of the people are suffering, are in, in suffering, are in pain, are, are in agony due to socio-economic, cultural and also psychological and other factors and as a result of many other factors we could see this in the modern world especially uh, in a country like Sri Lanka more and more people are having difficulties hardship struggles and there is a solution to that that solution is we need to become sensitive to the sufferings and the hardships of other people we must be, we must live in solidarity with them and we should arrange our lives. We should come up with a simple lifestyle so that the way we live become a blessing unto others, unto the whole humanity. If not, I have become a burden unto other people by the way I have been living my life. We should never follow that path. So infinite humility is very, very crucial for the modern world. And if we go to now, the Gospel of Luke, the same teaching uh, Gospel of Luke says like this, or documents like this. Uh, let us read from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verse 20. So the same teaching, this is how Luke puts it, St. Luke puts it. And he lifted up his eyes on his disciples and said, Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Actually, the concept of poor is a biblical concept. In the Old Testament, the <coughs> Hebrew word used is anavim, the humble the needy, the poor, and the marginalized, etc. It has many uh, connotation. Its meaning is very rich, actually. So the meek or the poor, the humble, etc. Now, we need to look at poverty from the perspective of Christ, from the perspective of God. Most of the time we look at it negatively. Of course, there is a negative aspect, but it should not be a hindrance for us to experience God. Our poverty, our economic hardships must never become obstacles to experience God and to uh, enter into a, an intimate relationship. So our perspective about it should be broadened. There are, there are no obstacles to God whatsoever, even our very poverty. 
In fact, that becomes a grand opportunity for us to depend on him. The poorer we are, the more we must rely on God. The more difficult life becomes, all the more we must cling unto him. There is no other solution actually. From the world authorities, political ideologies, political parties, ultimately there is no adequate solution to human problems. To certain extent, such groups, parties, ideologies could work out some solutions, of course, but not the total solution, not the real solution. Because as humans, humans are weak, humans are limited. Humans have, human capacity is limited. And our very struggle should be, our very struggle should become paths and uh, means to get closer and closer and closer to God. Even our poverty is not a hindrance. In fact, kingdom of God, we could have an experience of the kingdom of God through our day-to-day -day struggles. For an example, if one is facing 500 problems today, if a person is undergoing 500 problems and difficulties, that person has 500 opportunities to rely on God, to depend on God. If the same person, let's say, would face 5,000 problems tomorrow, then that person would have received 5,000 opportunities, openings to depend on God and to get closer to God and to cling unto God. So our perspective should be very broad. If we take it as a burden, and if you are very negative about it, if you always complain, then we would miss a great op miss an opportunity. So even at poverty and economic difficulties, we need to look at from the perspective of God. Not only that, actually, uh, the Beatitudes mean the spirituality of Christ. That's how he lived his life. He was poor in spirit. Therefore, he was able to become a blessing unto the people who are suffering, people who are poor and having difficulties. That's his spirituality. That was his lifestyle. That's the way he lived his life. So he's simply articulating his spirituality in these teachings. He had lived them to the fullest. And then he is expressing them now in words and communicating his own spiritual life in words for our benefit. So it's not something he kind of fabricated or he created superficially and artificially. No, it is something he lived out and he found it very meaningful and he's inviting us to live our lives also the same way, the way he lived. The other factor we need to understand, even with regard to not only the poor, but also the rich, he's inviting us to undergo conversion. You need an experience of transformation to understand the meaning of both spiritual and material poverty. And to see the opportunities in situation of difficulties. So the perspective is very important. That's why when he began his ministry, the very first word, the very first sentence he uttered was, the kingdom of God is at hand, repent. The kingdom of God is at hand, repent. That was the very first word or the sentence he uttered even before he recruited his disciples. So repentance is for every person, not only the rich, but also the poor, not only for the educated, but also the uneducated, not only for the powerful, but also for the weak, not only for men, but also for women, 
not only for his own Jewish people, but also for the non-Jewish people. Because when we undergo repentance, we see the, with the repentance, with the transformation of our lives, with that ongoing change in our lives, we begin to live humbly. Then we know we have to depend on him. Now the word repentance, the English word repentance, actually translated from a Greek word in the uh, New Testament. The Greek noun is metanoia. The Greek verb is metanoite. So actually there are two roots there in the word metanoia. One is meta, the Greek word meta. The other Greek word is nous, N-O-U-S. Nous means mind, meta means beyond. So you need to go beyond your present mentality. It should shift in our mentality. In the Old Testament, they use the Hebrew word shub, a change of orientation in life, a whole orientation. You reorient your whole life. You come up with a shift, a paradigm shift in your life. So in metanoia, what, what happens to me is, I see the world from the perspective of God. I see things the way God sees. So with God, every situation is an opportunity, not a hindrance. Every difficulty is an opportunity, a grand opening. So, and one has to begin to see, uh, one has to begin to see life from that perspective. It's good for poor as well as for the rich. So without undergoing this deep conversion, this transformation, we cannot actually serve others. In order to become a blessing unto other people, even in our difficulties, even in our hardships, we need to change our life, lives. When we change our lives, we naturally become a blessing unto other people. People who do not undergo change, people who, do not, who are not willing to change their lives, are going to become a burden unto other people forever, until the day they die. Especially, this is true when it comes to our destructive behavioral pattern, our destructive and sinful tendencies. So conversion means we begin to love ourselves also. We begin to love our lives, actually. I begin to appreciate this gift of life, which I have received from God. Not only that, I begin to do justice to that life I have received from God. So not to repent, if one is not repenting, that means he or she is not yet loving one's life. Example, let's say if there is an, a drug addict, if he or she makes a decision to change one's lifestyle, so he begins to love one's life. He wants to stop sinning. He wants to stop the process of uh, self-destruction and take care of his life. It is, to be, it is to take care of one's life, doing justice to one's life. So when you take care of your life by stopping sinning, you could also take care of other people's life. In other words, when you begin to love your own life, you could easily love other people. So repentance means an act of self-love, an act of self-care. Without that aspect of repentance, without that experience of repentance, we can never love other people because I am not loving myself in the first place. I am destroying my life and I continue to destroy my life. Therefore, how could I become a blessing unto other people? So with that transformation, with that change, I begin to see every situation as an opportunity to get closer and closer and closer to God. Then even pow poverty is not a hindrance for me to get closer to God. 
poverty becomes an opportunity. It doesn't mean, you see, everybody should become poor and then uh, uh, we are not glorifying poverty, especially the forced poverty, the, 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 the sufferings. But even in the midst of sufferings, there is an aspect we need to become aware about. And also when it comes to the sufferings of other people, we must allow the sufferings of other people to transform us or to evangelize us and to give us a deeper understanding about the deeper meaning of life. So that is why when people, uh, when people suffer, when people are undergoing difficulties, hardships and uh, decisive struggles, uh, we, we need to see the deeper meaning in those struggles. So we must allow the sufferings of other people to transform us, to make us better Christians, so that we could express also our concern about them, their situation. So then the gap between them and us becomes less and less and less. Because people who suffer, they know there are people who are concerned about us, who think about us, who pray for us, and who try to help us out in whatever way they could. So then the gap between these different groups become less and less and less. There is a greater sense of solidarity amongst different groups of people. Then we have the feeling humanity is one. We are all children of God. We are children of one father. You see, then we become one again as a human family. In fact, humanity cannot have two futures. You see, it's one of the very clear uh, ma uh, messages of uh, the Bible. Humanity cannot have two futures. One future for some people, another future for some other people. Or one future for some nations, another future for some other nations. Or one future for, let's say, the so-called educated people, one future for uneducated and struggling people. No, that's not God's intention. Humanity has only one future or no future at all. It's either it's for us, it's the kingdom of God or destruction, annihilation for the whole humanity. So that is why we need to be in solidarity with the difficult difficulties of other people more and more. Then humanity come together. You see, we become concerned about each other. We become brothers and sisters of each other. We become the members of the same family. So in order to do that, the interior transformation is very important. In fact, all the teachings in Christianity is about social transformation, but in and through the process of self-transformation. All the teachings are about ultimately kingdom of God, in other words. So what's the purpose of all these teachings? And what's the purpose of the whole biblical revelation? The kingdom of God, but in and through the transformation of the person. For a transformation of the world, there has to be a person or there has to be persons who had undergone transformation. In order to create a new world, there has to be a new creature a new woman and a new man, a new person. Only a new person in Christ could create a new society, a new world, a new uh, human family. So they are like two sides of the same coin, uh, personal transformation on the one hand and the social transformation on the other hand. They are intimately interlinked and interconnected. You cannot separate the two. And also one process cannot go on without the other. So that is the nature of his message. That is the nature of his revelation. 
in order to understand we need to acquire we need to appropriate the mind of christ the eyes of christ we need to look at the reality from the eyes of christ the way christ jesus sees reality then only we begin to understand the teachings of jesus because then we begin to interpret the teachings of jesus from the perspective of jesus that is the most accurate perspective that is the broadest viewpoint about it it's not according to what we like or according to our personal uh, desires no it's according to his own perspective because christ uh, clearly had mentioned as you know i you did not choose me but i chose you for what to execute his own agenda in this world so where are we going to read his own agenda it's in the gospel it is his good news that is the agenda of christ and we are only servants of his agenda so the agenda is not ours but christ's so let us try to somehow appropriate that perspective let us try to reach up to the mind and the spirit of christ in our witnessing process as his disciples as his servants and as his slaves thank you very much and may god bless you all